Good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, I'm Sharad Chole, Chief Scientist from Expedera. Thank you for joining our webinar. Today, I would like to talk about Edge AI. The hardest challenge for building an Edge AI SOC is to find the right sized NPU. Existing solutions are, in some sense, derivatives of server class architectures. And these solutions can be best described as underutilized, power hungry, and they heavily rely on external memory bandwidth. What industry needs is an NPU which is edge friendly, is an NPU which is built for resource constraint devices. At Expedera, we have done exactly that in our journey, and I would like to share that with you, how we came to this architecture and how we enable diversity of neural networks on top of this architecture using packet-based approach. We have a live Q&A session at the end of this webinar. Uh, please feel free to enqueue your questions in the webinar widget or the Q&A widget that you see on your screen. Before we dive deeper, here is a bit of a background about myself. Uh, I'm chief scientist and co-founder of Expedera. I, uh, I have been a field of hardware software code design for last 10 years. Uh, I worked at Cisco before I uh, uh, co-founded this company four years back. And uh, at Cisco, I primarily worked on data flow architectures for packet buffers and reconfigurable mapping tables. Uh, prior to that, I was uh, in embedded memory space as well as uh, in uh, data data management systems in Microsoft. Edge AI SOCs come in a different form factor. It can be your headsets which are doing audio denoising, or it can be your point and shoot cameras which are doing image enhancement and video enhancement or it can be ADAS systems in automotive vehicles. One thing that is common across all this market segment is that significant amount of resources are being allocated for neural network processing. Here are a couple of examples which are well recognized in the industry. And you can see that up to 40% of the area is being allocated for just NPU. Now this is not sustainable. As we want to keep on growing the TOPS and keep on scaling the computational capacity of the NPU to meet the neural network processing demands, we cannot imagine to growing this area to double the amount of computation required for the next generation. We cannot just double the area in this SOC that is being allocated for the NPU. And the similar things are true for other system resources, including power, on-chip memory, as well as external memory bandwidth. So what industry needs is an NPU, which is highly utilized, which uses the effective amount of max that have been put in the system, and which is scalable for future generations, which can scale without really adversely affecting the area requirement for the NPU. We also need to look at this from the application point of view. What applications needs is out-of-box performance. Applications want immediate performance for their neural network without really waiting for optimizations coming from software tool chain or coming from compiler enhancement. And this enables the application deployment in highly efficient fashion while getting the best benefit of the max that has been allocated. Applications also needs to make sure that they have been running at the edge in a resource constraint environment where there's a limited amount of bandwidth available, which needs to be utilized in a sustained fashion, where the peak should be very close to average. Also, the similar thing is true for power due to thermal and battery constraints. We also see applications becoming more complex, that it's not just a single neural network that has been executed. 
it's a series of neural network either executing in pipeline fashion or in parallel with each other. We can take a simple example of teleconferencing where a person needs to be detected in the frame and then the background needs to be cropped simultaneously while recognizing the gesture by doing hand recognition as well as palm key point detections. So this is four different models running somewhat in a pipeline and a parallel fashion altogether while guaranteeing the latency for each of the model so that it fits in the 30 frames per second pipeline for the deployments. And this problem gets even trickier when we look at the workloads. Here we are taking example of five different workloads from image classification object detection to language understanding. And you can see the simple characteristics like how many operation it needs, how many weights does the neural network have, and how many activations or intermediate data is being generated for a processing of a frame. All these characteristics are completely diverse. And this diversity makes it extremely hard for any compiler or software tool chain to be able to optimize different different class of neural networks on top of the NPU. The goal for the edge friendly NPU is to be able to solve all this variety of deployment constraints in a simplified fashion where the solution is not just tailored towards one class of application. And this is really important as the neural networks are keep on evolving and the diversity of the layers that are being used is always growing. We already see transformers are being used in vision related tasks and convolution are being used in LSTM. And we expect the diversity to keep on grow. So we need a tool chain, we need a framework to think how to optimize the networks that we haven't even know of today five years in the future on the hardware that we develop today. So why are current solutions not able to achieve this? At Expedera, when we surveyed different architectures for NPU processing, we could categorize them broadly in two different buckets, instruction-based architectures and a layer-based architectures. Now, instruction based architectures are one human architecture that have been around like with us since inception of computing. Um, for example, CPUs or general purpose GPUs or DSP architectures. The major bottleneck between these architecture is the scalability of a single core that there is a limited like there is a limit to how much a single core can scale and to achieve higher computational capacity this architecture has to scale to multi core deployments. And in the multi-core deployments, there is an overhead in terms of synchronization, the operand sharing, reduction of results, coherency, and memory hierarchy. And all this overhead results in area inefficiency as well as power inefficiency for neural network execution. On the other hand, a layer-based architectures have been recently gaining popularity due to ability to do just-in-time compilation. So here a control CPU can just say request execution of a certain layer and when the execution finishes the controls come back to the CPU. Those such architectures require the entire activation, the entire input activation to be present before the layer needs to be layer, layer execution is started. And so this requires large amount of on-chip memory as well as the optimizations on top of these architectures are only limited to reordering of the layers in the neural network, which means there is a limit to which we can achieve parallelization in the different engines, as well as how much we can optimize to reduce the memory footprint. So what we realize is we needed a compute abstraction, uh, which is different from these two. We needed a compute abstraction which is at a higher level than instructions, but which does not prohibit us from looking at neural networks at more fine grained labels. And this is where we define packets. So a packet is 
a contiguous fragment of a neural network layer. In this example, you can see AlexNet as a neural network on the right hand side. And the second convolution net like layer is being broken into four different convolution packets. And the last max pool layer is broken into three different max pool packets. Now, the compilation for the neural network using packets, you can think of it as a simply two step process. There is a one norm to take in the neural networks and break it into packets, each layer to break it into packets. And the second step is to actually reorder the packets based on the goals that we have. And these goals can be either the latency, throughput, or reduction of the bandwidth, or reduction on the on-chip memory required. And these patented reordering algorithms make it extremely simple to take the neural network and just execute them in the most efficient fashion. Now, when we are reordering the packets, we are still satisfying the dependency between the layers. So the the mathematical equivalence of the neural network is still preserved. But the reordering allows us to re look at the dependencies between the packets rather than just focusing on the dependencies between the layers. And this fine-grained dependencies allows to look at the temporary data in a different way, where we can remove the temporary data if it's not being used. And we can also use this reordering to be able to parallelize different different layers. So in this example, a convolution 2 can be run in parallel with max pull 1 if there is no dependency. And these packets, even though they are from different layers or different part of the network, they can still coexist and co run simultaneously as the data dependency is not is still satisfied. Now, once we have a packet stream, this packet stream is run natively on hardware sequences in the expeditor as NPU. These hardware sequences are responsible for guaranteeing the throughput as well as the execution, uh, efficient execution of the packets on the underlying building blocks. And we have a hardware resource manager which guarantees that the minimum amount of memory is being utilized while processing the packet stream. Now, because packets look at fine-grained dependency and the reordering allows us to remove the intermediate data as quickly as possible, the memory required for packet-based execution is mathematically minimal, that it is the optimal amount of memory that is needed for any neural network execution. And by using the parallelization between different packets or packets of different layers, we can guarantee that different different resources are always busy, including different computational blocks, as well as memory accesses and data movements. One of the key benefits we talked about is how we reduce the temporary data. And we, I want to go through an example of this. So here we are talking about YOLO v3 sixoid by sixoid batch of two with the specification on the left. On the right hand side, you can see the total number of DDR transfer required for this execution or this inference of batch of two with layer based approach versus a packet based approach. And you can clearly see that because packet-based approach are uh, uses like removes the intermediate data as soon as it is being generated, the only bandwidth required is for weight transfer. And while layer-based approach is still limited by the execution order of the neural network layers. This the benefit of this is that with the same bandwidth we can run higher FPS or we can reduce the bandwidth required for neural network inference significantly and try to keep the data locality, maintain the data locality of the temporary data. Another benefit is using packets, we, it is very easy for us to hide the latency variations that we see in the system fabric. So without really having a huge buffer overhead, we can parallelize the accesses to external memory which can have latency variation and we can achieve sustained utilization of the bandwidth as well as be predictable in terms of execution even in the unpredictable latency cases.
I mentioned earlier that packet are complete, which means the entire inputs, outputs, attributes, as well as the bandwidth and the memory requirement of packet execution are deterministic. And so is the execution in the hardware, which means that we know the complete, we can model the complete trace of a packet execution on hardware accurately. And we can extrapolate this and take it to a higher level where using packets as a fundamental block, we can model the execution of the entire neural network. And we use this to build an estimator tool. We understand that NPU doesn't stand by itself. It is part of the SOC environment where it has to interact with other blocks of the SOC. And these tools allow us to take care of that. It allows us to model the network traffic with respect to the SOC blocks that an architect needs to right size. So let's talk a little about our hardware architectures, that how the hardware architectures enable the packets execution. So you can see here on the right hand side, the diagram, where there are only five different fundamental building blocks. And these building blocks are tiled in XY grid fashion. Now there is no global connectivity between these blocks, so that means that there is no interconnect that is stopping the scalability or tiling of the blocks. Each block only talks to its neighbor and they can be just continuously tiled to be able to scale to and achieve the higher T-Ops. This architecture remains monolithic from 128 T-Ops 1 1 to 128 T-Ops. It remains completely scalable while maintaining the same level of utilization. Because each of the building block is independent from the other, we can configure the blocks to be uh, as per the customer requirements. And this also allows a computational scalability of the matrix execution engine independent of the memory, which means we can scale the TOPS without really impacting the overall area of the system. Usually to double the amount of TOPS, it takes around 10 to 20% of the area overhead. The entire architecture is implemented as a deeply pipeline fashion, and which means that all the operands and the results are carried in a fashion that is, uh, in a way that is really, um, in a way that is efficient and we doesn't have overhead in terms of data movement. And this is true for instructions as well. And all these techniques allows us to effect to efficiently execute a neural network layer and achieve 18 TOPS per watt power efficiency. Now, one thing to note that when we reorder the packets, we are switching between layers. And by switching between layers, we are changing the context of execution. To avoid the penalty of this switching between layers, the hardware implements zero penalty, zero overhead context switching. And by giving zero overhead of context switching, the compiler is free to optimize any way it seems fit and possible at a higher level, while the utilization doesn't really depend on the size of the packet. So a packet can be of very small size, it can be a single size packet or a very large size of a, like 10,000 size, like 10,000 cycle packet. And in both the cases of single cycle to 10,000 cycle, the utilization will be still be fully uh, enabled throughout the hardware execution engine. And this gives us the ability to achieve 70 to 90% utilization on most of the neural networks that we see in the wild. We enable this NPU through a robust software tool chain using Apache TVM. TVM is a great open source project which allows us to interface with existing deep learning frameworks like PyTorch, TensorFlow, Onyx, and Keras. It also enables the NPU integration into the SOC environment, where a neural network can be broken down and can be executed on NPU and CPU and GPU. The expeditor runtime uses determinism as a primary principle to guarantee SLA to give SLA guarantees in terms of latency and throughput and still schedule on multi-core environments. The entire stack 
had an objective of being transparent about the matrices like FPS latency and power. And this has been built in both offline stack as well as online stack. You can use your, our estimation tool to be able to predict the performance that you will get in the deployment. And the profiler and debuggers allows a quick deployment uh, observability into the applications as well as the neural network runtime. Till now we looked at software and hardware architectures. But let me go over some third party benchmarking data. On this slide you see two reports that have been done by Tech Insights. And these reports are available to download by contacting us. On the left hand side you see a comparison for ResNet 50 performance per watt. And Expedera's NPU is four to five times better than the industry leading solutions. On the right hand side you can see the scalability between different different architectures and Expedera's architectures has the largest scalability where it can scale from 1 T ops to 128 T ops. On the bottom you can also see the benefits in terms of the maximum single core performance as well as the power efficiency and the area efficiency of the NPU solution that we provide. We looked at third party data, but I am also very eager to share a customer testimonial with you. This is a case study for one of our primary customer, which is already in mass production in six nanometer. And they had a demanding use case of doing 4K video enhancement at the sensor frame rate. Their previous generation weren't able to satisfy their performance requirement and it was actually above the power budget that they had for their edge SOC. Using Expedera's technology, we are able to achieve a 18 T ops worth of real time performance while enabling while enabling the customer to do this uh, processing without ever requiring an external memory transfer. With this, we are able to showcase that the current, the Expedera's NPU performed 20 times better than the previous generation NPU while taking less than half the power for the execution for the video announcement. Thank you very much for joining us. We will now open to live Q&A. Thank you again. Thanks for your attention. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for the live Q&A. Uh, my name is Paul Karazuba. I head marketing here at Expedera, of course, joined by Shirad Chole. If you have any questions for us, please go ahead and insert those questions directly into the uh, Q&A widget. But we do have a couple questions already. So, uh, Sherrod, um, in the presentation, you mentioned packets. Uh, what's actually inside of a packet? Uh, so packet actually has the entire context of uh, execution. Uh, so it, uh, it, it knows what uh, neural network operation needs to be performed. Uh, it knows uh, uh, where the data resides as well as where the uh, generated results needs to be stored at. And there are others, uh, I mean, this is uh, for computational packet, but there are other part of uh, other types of packet as well where there is a synchronization information or memory bandwidth information in the same sense. So just to summarize packet, overall has a complete context of execution. And uh, the NP uses this complete context to be able to execute and guarantee the utilization of the underlying hardware. Okay. How do you measure utilization? Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, so uh, for us, uh, the utilization is actually the Mac utilization of the system. So uh, if uh, for uh, uh, let's take an example of a neural network uh, which is running at uh, 10 frames per second. 
and just by knowing what the neural network is we can compute the amount of operations in the neural network uh, like like uh, for example resnet 50 has 8 billion operations at 224 by 224 images right mm -hmm. so we can take the 10 frames per second and multiply it by 8 billion operation and that gives you uh, like uh, 80 billion operations that you are actually generating right and then the utilization is actually this effective performance that we have or the effective t ops that we had uh, divided by the computation that is theoretically provided. Okay. And the so actual, provided, actual versus theoretical results is what you're saying. Yeah, it's actual versus theoretical. And theoretically, it's easy to calculate uh, based on taking the uh, number of max times two times frequency. And that's that's basically what the theoretical performance is. Understood. Thank you. Uh, another question from a member of the audience. Uh, you mentioned low memory needs uh, for the Expedera product. Uh, how much memory? Uh, does it actually require? Uh, so, uh, mm, this this uh, how much memory question is uh, neural network dependent. What we can uh, so for example, if the neural network are uh, 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 very like either they have either small weight or small input resolution or small activations. That might result in smaller memory requirement. Um, there is uh, techniques that we can use to actually do batching or uh, dynamic batching, mm -hmm. where we can trade off like uh, computation with the memory and uh, generate more like uh, or trade off performance to reduce the bandwidth, right? And mm -hmm. in using these techniques, um, we can guarantee that the memory requirement for a certain workload is minimized, uh, is uh, as minimal as possible given the on-chip memory in the system. Mm -hmm. But uh, there is there is no single number that I can say. It, it actually depends on the workload. It depends on what uh, neural networks that we are considering in, under execution. OK. Uh, great question here from the audience. Uh, do you support more than TVM, uh, for instance, TF Lite? Um, so, uh, there, there, there is a couple of, uh, part of, to this question. Uh, first is, uh, what, uh, front end do we support, um, uh, using the, our current tool chain, the TVM, uh, allows us to interface with, uh, all existing deep learning frameworks, uh, mm -hmm. including TensorFlow, PyTorch, uh, TF Lite, Onyx, quantized models, as well as floating point models. And, mm -hmm. uh, so we do support all those front ends uh, through our TVM stack. And then there are the questions about uh, what do we support as a runtime? And in such cases, uh, we do support the runtime on bare metal as well as through TVM. And we also have a support for runtime through TF Lite delegates. Great. Uh, here's a question. Uh, I'll probably take this one. Uh, what's your business model? So um, Expedera is a semiconductor IP company. So we uh, license our IP to chip makers or to OEMs, ODMs, uh, anyone who'd be building their own silicon um, with a typical semiconductor IP licensing model. But uh, great question. Um, let's see, we got a couple more here. Uh, so Sharon, I'm gonna ask this one to you. Um, in your slides, you wrote zero overhead context switching. Can you be a little more uh, clear about what you mean by that? Uh, okay, so uh, let me start with uh, saying what what do we mean by context switching? Because it's that that term is uh, borrowed from um, a CPU world. Uh, so in CPU world, context switching means switching between either different threads or different processes. Uh, for us, the context switching means switching between different layers. So uh, we we can switch between the first layer and the second layer, or the first layer and the third layer. And that's what we call a context switching without really finishing the entire layer, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason to actually push for zero overhead of context switching in the hardware was uh, to give the complete flexibility to compiler about how to optimize the neural network. Mm -hmm. So you, you can think of like the complexities in the compilers usually are generated or usually stems from the limitation of the hardware, right? Like if compilation is a process of optimizing a one specific goal that might um, have adverse effect on certain other aspects of the uh, hardware execution. Mm -hmm. 
And to avoid this complexity, uh, we actually push for uh, zero cost about context switching. So that means that compiler is free to execute or to define a schedule the way it's best fitted at the higher level. So compiler is like working towards how to achieve the best utilization, how to reduce the memories, how to achieve best latency or throughput and so on and so forth, rather than worrying about how adversely it will impact the hardware execution. And the hardware execution guarantees because of zero overhead context switching that uh, any of such compiler optimization can be directly implemented and supported on hardware. Great. Uh, we have time for one more question, uh, and this actually might be the easiest question you're going to get all day. Um, what's your performance range? <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, the architecture is uh, extremely scalable. Uh, we, we have seen the block diagram. Um, uh, there are five different blocks. Those are tied together in a, a grid fashion. So, and uh, because uh, the communication between the blocks is only for the adjacent blocks, uh, there is no... Um, global interconnect or global bottleneck in the system. Mm -hmm. And this allows us to scale uh, very well uh, uh, from uh, very small sizes like one TOPS to uh, large sizes like one uh, similar to 128 TOPS of performance. And this is this is this is 100x scalability still while being a single core. Uh, this is uh, I'm, I'm still not mentioned the multi-core performance. It's still single core performance from one TOPS to 128 TOPS. And uh, when we uh, uh, so we do get customer requests which want more performance than that, um, and if if we if we, if you want to support more performance than that, we basically jump to multi-core solutions where uh, uh, five twelve T ops solutions can be uh, a four core solutions of one twenty T ops. Great, thank you. Um, if we did not get to your question, we will be happy to reach out privately. And if you have any questions for uh, Shrad, myself, or for Expedera, you can visit us at expedera.com or, of course, contact us at info at expedera.com. Thank you so much and have a great day.